tell me a little bit about being a woman in this space, because you you have a double uh, a double edged sword, so to speak, here. Because leaving a religion, any religion's tough, but particularly tough to leave Islam. And then when you couple that with all the stuff related to being a woman and being a secular woman in America in 2015 isn't that easy sometimes. Uh, how does that play into how you how you live? Um, well, let me start by saying there's so many people that I'm connected to through my through the organization and through meeting a bunch of ex-Muslims. I mean, I, th I don't think it'd be a stretch to say that I probably know uh, more ex-Muslims than most people, you know, in the world, you know, will ever know. Right. But there, and and what I what I hear consistently from a lot of women that the reason that they left the religion was because of the treatment of women, and a lot of it just didn't make any sense, and they didn't they didn't appreciate. They, they felt that they weren't being given the same kind of dignity as as men. And when they looked at it from that perspective, things changed. Feminism had a lot to do with it, which is very interesting when we talk about today's feminism here, because yeah. I haven't really found the feminist allies in the West that I thought I would find. I expected to, for them to be the first people to run to my defense, and a few have, but a small few. Um, I, I expected there to be a big rally with the you know, feminists from all over um, to come and talk about these issues, but I haven't found that to be the case at all. It's very disheartening. Yeah, so what is that strange alliance? Because you see this all the time. You know, a group like Code Pink that stands for women's rights and anti-war, you would think they would be standing for women's rights all over the globe, but instead they'll rant and rave and, you know, talk about Gaza. Meanwhile, if they ever went to Gaza, I'm pretty sure that these women would not be treated particularly well. So this double standard just endlessly exists, huh? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think it's, it's, it's very, like I said, it's disheartening for one. And because I was somebody that, that feminism was a huge part of me leaving religion. It was a huge part of me, of fueling me and the women's rights causes of fueling me into my activism. It's been especially painful to see that feminists are not always on my, on, on the same level as me. What I have found is that there's a lot of posts about women that say, Muslim women that say that they're empowered by the hijab, you know, and there'll be, they'll be on feminist West websites. They'll say, you know, I'm very empowered. Yeah. Uh, I did a job, and it's my political whatever. And you know, it, to me, it's it's wonderful for that particular woman if she feels that this is her choice, and this is what she wants to do, and this is how she wants to live her life. That's great. But a uh, Muslim woman that's wearing the hijab, uh, making a piece like that, is like a woman in you know 1930s America saying that I'm proud to be a housewife. I love staying home with my children. This is exactly where I want to be. Well, good for you. Maybe you do, and that's wonderful. It's good for you that everything in society aligned with your desire perfectly. <laughs> right. And now, you, and now you get to live this wonderful life. But you have to acknowledge that in 1930s America, women who maybe wanted to have a career weren't as free to do so, that there were so many different factors that were put, making it very, very difficult for them to live their life the way they wanted to. You have to be able to acknowledge that. In that same way, I want these hijabi women to be able to acknowledge that, hey, there's so many women who don't ascribe to these modesty codes, and they aren't free to live lives the way they want to. Yeah, well, and this, again, this is why the left has put themselves, in, or this regressive left has put themselves in such a crazy box. They should be defending women's options. They don't have to say you have to live a certain way, but they should at least give you the options. And that's also why they've been relentless on new atheists. So you get it now as a woman, you get it as an ex-Muslim. I don't know if you identify specifically with a, a new atheist, with new atheism. Do you consider yourself a new atheist? Well, what does that even mean? I'm not I, sure exactly. Nobody, nobody really seems to know. Uh, the best way I can describe it now, as our, at least as I've come to understand it, is that it's an atheist who is finally speaking up. So for that, for that version, that's what I would consider myself. Um, but, but the community, the left, really has been attacking atheists too. So you're on a, like a, you're, you're like spinning and you got <laughs> shots from all sides, huh? I, I, I definitely feel that way. I mean, I don't want to talk about how big of a victim I am because I don't like the, those kinds of politics. Yeah. But, but in general, I have felt that the people that on paper should be supporting me. Um, and I looked into this actually as a response to seeing the way that leftists have reacted. I've started to do more research on what liberal principles were and really trying to get a grounding on what it meant to be a liberal. And I feel, and Bill Maher has said this so many times, he said, I'm the real liberal. Yeah. And I think he's right. He's right when he says he's a real liberal. And I feel like I'm the real liberal. Yeah. So you're not gross and racist. That's what you're telling me? Oh, God. That... <laughs> that, that was so bad. That was so bad. And yeah. honestly, okay, here's here's 
when I was watching that, I kind of felt, I'm going to get haters for this, but I kind of, for Ben Affleck a little bit, I kind of thought, oh, it's cute that he's standing up, he thinks he's standing up for the poor oppressed minority, right? Mm -hmm. That's what he thinks he's doing. That's what he's really convinced that he's standing up for an oppressed group. And it's nice that he has good intentions. It's nice. I appreciate that. But he's so wrong. And he's really hurting these same minorities and he's not understanding exactly what's going on here. And it was very interesting in that particular scenario to see Sam and then very emotional Ben Affleck. Very, very emotional Ben Affleck and very calm Sam Harris. You know, I think you'll find this interesting. I was discussing this with, I, well, first off, I discussed it with Sam himself, right. but I also discussed it with Joe Rogan a couple weeks ago on his show, and I said what you just said. I said, well, you know, I think he was trying to do the right thing and trying to, and maybe he got too emotional, but, you know, he was trying to stand up for the downtrodden, that kind of thing. And Joe said something that I now fully believe. I mean, he got me to change my opinion like that. He said, no, he's like, man, I know actors. I'm around actors. They fake this so that everyone will just think they're so holy, they're so benevolent, they're so wonderful, and all that. And, and he was really convinced that that's what Ben was doing there. But I, I, don't, I don't want to waste any more, uh, any more time on, on that specifically. Um, so the atheist stuff, yeah, you're, get, you're getting it from them. You're getting it from the other guys. Um, what can we do then? What, what can secular people and free thinkers do? Because I know that people just by listening to this, a certain subset of people are gonna say all the things that you laid out at the beginning. They're gonna say that I hate Muslims, that you're a secret Zionist, all of this nonsense. Um, but what can we do? I guess just talk, right? I mean, is really that the best we can do? Absolutely, I mean, I think just be intellectually honest. And I think that a lot of people understand what I mean when I say that, because people stop themselves. They want to say these things. They have these opinions. And the reaction that I got to my speech at the American Humanist Association, the biggest reaction was, you said what I wanted to say. Yeah. You, you put the words that I was thinking in my head, but I just felt like I couldn't, I really couldn't articulate, and I felt trapped. And you said those things, so it felt like a release you know, for, for me to hear you say it, for, to hear somebody say it. And I think that if we can be brave and if we can talk about it, and especially liberals, it is very important that it is liberals who stand up for this because we are the compassionate ones, right? We're right. the ones that really are keeping the harm of, that, that, of the people in place. We, we are not forgetting about anti-Muslim bigotry. That is something that is, that is obviously at the forefront of, my, of our minds. We know that because that's why we're not saying anything about Islam, right? Yeah. We're afraid of this harm. Yeah. So it is those, particularly those people, that need to be speaking up, that need to be making this nuanced discussion. Right, and that's what it seems so obvious to me, that I don't have to twist my beliefs to say the things that I'm saying to you. Everything that I'm saying to you, and I sense everything that you're saying to me, is based in the same set of secular principles that you apply to everything else. And for some reason, these guys want you to just be a little more careful when it comes to this set of ideas. But what I see as the real danger there is that if we don't speak up right now, and, and we're at a, we're an extremely precarious moment right now with everything going on in Paris and with ISIS and all that, that if we don't speak up, we hand the future to the people on the right. Don't Absolutely. you think? Absolutely. They're, they're getting empowered by this because people are not stupid. Um, we are seeing that there is this big elephant in the room that people we, we cannot talk about, that the media isn't talking about. What are we doing? We're building distrust of your average American citizen when they're watching their TV screens and they're not seeing anybody but Fox News really talking about Islam in a way that, that feels remotely honest, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's horrible. It's horrible that we're, we're giving this up to these people who really have some uh, xenophobic motives, maybe, uh, you know? And we need to make sure that it is us that are talking about this, that are engaging with this issue. You can, it's, it's similar to, I think, what happened with the Tea Party. Um, I think there was some real hurt and some real pain right after uh, you know, the economic downturn. And I think a lot of people were feeling abandoned by their government. And I think we could have, I, I, I even say now, we could have seized on that moment and we could have made it a populist, progressive movement to take down you know, corporations or whatever it is. We could, have, we could have harnessed it, but instead we disdained those people because they were you know, backwater, bigots, whatever, people who were very, they don't understand things in a nuanced, complicated way, the, the way that everyone else does. And so we find it very easy to, uh, to, to just push them aside and dismiss them and look at what happened there. Right? They became a political force that a lot of people would say have done some harm yeah. in the political spectrum. So we don't want that happening again. Yeah, I don't know if you saw my video about it a couple weeks ago, but I said that the regressive left is 
our Tea Party. And I don't want what has happened to the right that has been dragged off the deep end, I don't want that happening to my side. That's why I do think we're at this moment. Um, so I know we, we only have a little bit left, uh, but I do want to focus on Paris a little bit. I know you're not, uh, you're not a terrorist uh, expert or something of that nature, um, but in terms of the, the human part of this, that it sounds like a lot of these people did grow up uh, in Paris or in France. They grew up in the West. Some of them grew up in Belgium, uh, but they grew up in Western societies. Um, what do you make of that kind of radicalization? Because, you know, I know a lot of the debate right now is about can we let refugees in? Are we going to let terrorists in with refugees and that? But there's also a homegrown problem right now that we're not dealing with. Yeah. I, well, this is my, in just my opinion, and again, I'm not a scholar on this, um, but I feel like w there are many young people in different parts of, of Europe especially, and I think Europe particularly, that feel that they are, and a lot of people say they're between two cultures, that's the phrase that people use, that they're between this Western culture and their culture back home, but I, I, I don't think that that's the truth. I think that the truth is that they don't really have any they don't really have any viable options. They don't really um, believe in the same stuff that, that their parents might have done from Pakistan or whatever, and they don't really fit in with the community in, in the West. And they sort of feel lost by this multiculturalist narrative, yeah. right? And I think that if we can push, uh, and, and, and a lot of people do have this specific critique. They say that we have lost our bearings, we have lost our values, we don't really push our story and our values and our, you know, and, and our way of the, looking at the world, we don't really advocate for that in the way that it deserves to be advocated for. And I think these are the people that are, they're the lost children of this, because these are people who don't have anything to, to they don't have anything to latch onto. What they do have to latch onto is if somebody comes and says this Islamist narrative, and everything makes so, so much sense, and it's everything is so clear now, and they can grapple onto it. I think you've covered this so many times you've, you've talked about this, uh, about freedom of speech issues, about how we're not allowed to talk about certain ideas. I think it's so harmful that we're not allowed to talk about critique of religion, critique of Islam, because we're, then we're, we're giving up this ground to, to the Islamists. We're letting them give these people these, um, the, these great narratives that they'll latch onto. And they don't have any opposing narrative at all. Yeah, so, so what do we do? I mean, really, what do the secularists do? I know that there are some organizations, like the one that Majid's involved in, uh, that are trying to de-radicalize people, show them that there's other outs. And, and I'm with you. I get it, that it's, it's a compounding of economic issues and, and religious narrative and imperial. It's all of these things. Um, but how do we move forward? Because the talking, as we're doing, it's good for now. But at some point, we, we got to get to these to the kids, I guess, the, the younger generation. Well, uh, this is something, I guess, related to the, the Syrian refugees that are coming in. A lot of people are very worried about the effect that these refugees will have on the countries. And I think the only long-term way of, of proceeding and making sure that we don't have these same kind of problems is to push immersion as much as we can, which means that we don't allow them to build these isolated little communities. We spread them out within uh, within the, the country and we pull them in into the you know American way of life or Western way of life, what have you. Um, in that sense, I think a lot of these multiculturalist narratives are very, very, very harmful. I think we need to discard them immediately. There's a lot of this, uh, there's a lot of hesitancy. We know, we know how to pull immigrants in and how to immerse them into our, our society. We know that. There's so much there's so much work about this and scholarly stuff about this, written about this. We can do it. Sure. We're if a we, nation of immigrants. If we wanted to, right? Every but, every one of us, every one of us here in America, we either are from immigrants or we were brought over as slaves or we're Native Americans. But right, but right. the large majority of us are immigrants. Right. And and you know what? Because what happened was America pulled us in and said, well here's the stuff I don't like. But here's the stuff I do like. And they pulled it together and we became this nation that is so powerful. And then what you have instead in places like the UK is that these mini nations that are not a part of the overall, you know, Britain, British society. There's a little Pakistani community mm -hmm. and a little North African community. And they sort of live as if they were back in Pakistan or Bangladesh or whatever it is. And that, I think, is so harmful because these people never feel like everyone else. I feel like an American, and I don't think everyone else does. And I want them to feel that way. I want them to feel like an American. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, because then when, when the British people go in and, try and go move into that community, then they feel like, those people in that community feel like they're under attack or something, 
or they have to defend their, their little area. So you have this constant battle of, you know, uh, of the self versus the, the bigger community. Yeah, and what, it, what has happened is that we've given up the battle, right? We've just said, okay, we'll just live however you want to live. You're just different people and you just operate on different rules and you have different concepts of human rights and that's just, we're just going to turn a blind eye. That's what's happened in the UK, I think. Yeah, and we can't do it anymore, right? No, we have to have these, I mean, we've always had with these immigrant communities in the United States, these negotiations, these back and forths with, and these scuffles, and sometimes they've been very painful. But in the end, we're stronger, and the immigrant community gets immersed and is stronger too. Yeah, all right, so my final thought would be, uh, I've been trying to end all my conversations on, on a note of positiveness, uh, and I think you've actually given a lot of hope throughout here, uh, but I definitely sense that the tide is turning. I know it feels like a dangerous time right now. There's, there's so much craziness going on. And with the internet, everything feels smaller. So when something happens 5,000 miles away, it seems like it happened in your backyard. But I do sense something good here. The fact that we've connected, the fact that all of these people now, that we're all in the same circles and we're all talking and our circles are getting bigger. Uh, I do feel like maybe the tide will turn in our favor. Do you, do you feel that? Give me something good to end on here. I think I think you're absolutely right. You've mentioned this before. I noticed that things are changing, and I feel this. And I think Majid Nawaz had said it too before, where he said the left is changing, and he feels this. You, you can sort of you can sense it in the air that there's discontent there, that there's people where suddenly there's a lot of dissonance going on yeah. in people's minds, and we want it to make sense. And I think that we're giving, you know, this, this point of view that we're giving is one that is so much more clear, and it's so much better for people and better for humanity, and I think people will will slowly gravitate towards it. Yeah, you know, it's funny, I, I did a video on free speech last week, and at the end I referenced, you know, all of this stuff with safe, safe spaces and trigger warnings and all of this nonsense, and it's like when I speak to someone like you and I speak to Majid and Ayan and Sam and all these people, I, I said in the video, I was like, look guys, watch my videos with these people. If you think these are the extremists, then there's something wrong with you. It's not something wrong with them. You know, Majid and Sam just wrote a book called the Islam and the Future of Tolerance. It wasn't called Islam and, and the Future of, you know, Weapons of Mass Destruction, you know? Right. Uh, anyway, well, it, it's an absolute pleasure. I'm, I'm so glad we connected and we're able to do this. And, and you're doing such great work. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so it's at Sarah the Hater on Twitter. And uh, everyone should check out your group, which is ex-Muslims of North America. And we're going to stay in the loop. And uh, next time you're in L.A., dinner's on me. All right. All right. Bye. Thanks a lot, Sarah.